Hello and welcome to another Facebook Live with the World Health Organization. Today we're going to talk about mental health and COVID, a subject that I think is close to many people's hearts um, and minds. Uh, today I have with me Devorah Castell, who's a director of the Mental Health and Substance Use Department, and someone you're used to seeing more often, Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, who's the technical lead for COVID. She knows the ins and outs of COVID. Um, you see her in these Facebook Lives and our press conferences as well. So we're on uh, Twitter today, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. If you have a question, which we hope you do, on Twitter, you can do hashtag AskWHO. That's how we normally take questions. And then drop your question into the comments in Facebook and YouTube. So just to start off, um, off the very top, would you agree that this is a stressful situation for just about everybody? Yes, that's the, the easy answer is yes, I do agree. It is uh, stressful. There are um, a number of reasons that we could go uh, through now or later, but a number of reasons why uh, we, we, we think that the current situation is having an impact on, on the mental health of everybody. Sure, well, let's get into some of those reasons. I know okay. before we started, we talked a little bit about how the uncertainty of this. None of us, unless you're over 100 years old, has been through a global pandemic before. We don't know how long it will last. So those are two, you know, that's a chunk of, of uncertainty right there. What else? We don't know uh, what is uh, happening. We don't know. We are uh, afraid of, uh, of, of getting infected. Uh, we are afraid of having uh, of, of losing somebody or somebody getting sick uh, next to us or, or dying. We are. Uh, uh, we have been struggling, many of us, uh, at different moments and in different conditions with issues of staying at home and uh, uh, issues related to adjust to working from home that uh, has been totally uh, new for most of us. Um, people that have lost uh, their job or a crisis that we may see coming, uh, economic and social impact and, and, and of the current crisis and how this will have an impact on us. Now, all this is, is uncertainty. All this is not knowing how to, to how it's going to be tomorrow. Um, there are a number of other issues that I could add to the list as uh, good reasons why we may be feeling uh, stressed uh, uh, or afraid and are related to uh, many, many parents having to do schooling at home and not being ever have been trained to do that and mixing that with working or um, uh, of course uh, the, the issue of uh, health workers in particular and uh, the consequences that that uh, stress uh, on their daily life may have in them, in their family. So I, 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 the, the list is really long, uh, all their people and their, uh, the risks that we have been uh, listening uh, for them in particular. Um, the children not able to go to school and have to find other ways of uh, living a life and trying to understand what is this that is happening out there. Uh, adolescents or youth that have been planning to go to school, finish their school, find a job, a uh, future life, mm -hmm. and now they are uh, in, in between situations. So it's almost any age group. There's, there's uncertainty and um, again, with not knowing how long it will last, it's not only you're uncertain about now, but you're uncertain for an uncertain period of time. It's, it's every age group and every social group uh, that will be affected uh, from this perspective and of course it will depend on a number of conditions how you uh, manage that uh, those concerns that that we have how you can overcome some of those challenges uh, but uh, but you're right it is uh, affecting uh, it, it is not discriminating for one's uh, this situation I just have two housekeeping things I want to say off the top um, one is that we are often asked why we're not wearing masks. Uh, people think that there should be masks worn at all times. It may be uh, what you are recommended in your country, but in terms of WHO's guidance, as long as you can stay one meter apart, which we took care that we are one meter or more apart, then you don't need to wear a mask, especially as well we're in a space that has good ventilation. So that's one thing um, to mention off the top. And then just again, if you have any questions, um, please ask them in Twitter via hashtag AskWHO and drop it in the comments. I will be looking at your questions on my phone, so that's why I keep glancing down. We'll keep glancing down at my phone. 
Let's talk a little bit about, um, we spoke very, very broadly about people uh, in, in different situations. What if somebody already is living with, uh, with a mental health issue? How is it for them um, to have these extra stresses? What, what are some things that we would suggest for people in those situations? The, thank you for this uh, question because uh, I, uh, those are among some of the groups that are in, in a more vulnerable uh, situation, vulnerable condition. And uh, what is important is that uh, people with ongoing um, mental health conditions or, or, or other conditions can uh, make sure that they have uh, a, a, a routine to keep taking uh, medication if that is the situation or to continue um, seeing, uh, visiting, uh, 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 maybe uh, virtually or, or on the phone or, or in any possible way, a therapist, if, if that was the situation. Again, if there were medications to make sure that there is a stockpile of uh, medication for at least two weeks, three weeks, so that there is not the anxiety added of running out of that. And uh, try to continue with the indications that uh, you have received if uh, that was the case from your uh, care professional. It is important in any case of people with any kind of mental health condition to have somebody uh, they trust to talk to, whether it is the specialist that has been taking care of them or also a, a friend, a colleague, a relative, uh, somebody, a family member that could be uh, somebody we could uh, reach out to, to, to get, uh, to express what's going on and to get some initial a help or, or, or indications of where to go, how to manage it. Thank you. So that was speaking very specifically for people who already need to take medication because they're <coughs> under medication or to continue therapy if they're under therapy. We have a question from Twitter from Jim Roop. What is the most common way stress, anxiety, or negative mental health will manifest themselves? Um, what do people say or feel or experience the most and what can be done to help? So generally. Oh, that is a very difficult question to answer to because uh, there is a huge variety of, of uh, ways uh, uh, um, the situation could manifest itself. Uh, the sufferance or the, or the anxiety or the stress caused by the current situation could come up in a number of, uh, of ways that uh, it will be too long to list them all. But uh, we are talking about uh, anxiety, we are talking about uh, challenges uh, maybe to sleep, we are talking about different difficulties to concentrate, we are talking about feel, feeling sad, struggling to get up of, out of bed every morning, uh, not being able to do what we were supposed to be doing, whether it is working, having fun, chatting with people. Any of these and all of them could be uh, signs of uh, something that is not uh, going well. And in fact, in waves as well, you're not experiencing all of those things all at the same time, maybe a bit of this, a bit of that, feel better for a while and then feeling bad again and so on, yeah? Thank you, yes, because the situation is changing and uh, we are learning uh, every time uh, new things, whether it is about the pandemic itself or whether it is about the most uh, close environment or, or context we are living in. I mean, it can be that uh, today I'm working for ho from home, but tomorrow I'm going to the office, but day and after I don't know if I will have my job. So uh, the school is open or the school is not open and the implications that that has with our kids. So all that uh, continuous uh, changing situation will generate difficult, uh, different reactions on, on, on each one of us. And therefore, what can we do about it? And what tools, I know WHO has some tools and you've brought some with you, but what, what do we suggest people do to manage that? There are a number of issues that we, we recommend in general, and I will, I will suggest also to go to our webpage and look at uh, a, a page we created that is uh, being healthy at home, and there is a section on mental health. And there are some concrete tips uh, about things that could be done, like uh, uh, make sure, uh, how and when you get the information that is relevant for, uh, for the current situation. You need to know what's going on, but try to make sure how frequently you get those news and, and from which uh, reliable sources you get those news from. It is important to stay uh, socially connected, so whether it is uh, 
uh, respecting the physical distancing that is needed. So whether it is in your net, uh, family uh, context or, or, or through the media, it is important that uh, we, we try to avoid as much as possible uh, negative coping mechanisms such as alcohol or, or drugs of any kind. So, um, any excess on that will worsen our uh, mental well-being. Um, it is, uh, we have some other concrete tools that I brought here, <laughs> and one is this that uh, about uh, how to manage stress. And this is something that uh, doing what matters in times of uh, stress is an illustrated guide, and I, I hope I can show something without making a confusion about the very easy way of using it and there are very concrete recommendations and, and, and exercises that we can do on our own. There are some audio recording also to help and uh, if we do that uh, every day on a regular basis at some point we will incorporate them and will help us to manage stress for example. Uh, there is also a very nice uh, um, uh, book, a storybook that we developed uh, for children, children between 6 and 11 years old, that was done consulting uh, over a thousand children and, 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 and carers, parents, etc., and, and describes uh, through a story uh, how to explain to children of those of that age what is going on with with COVID and there are videos and it's translated in over a hundred languages and videos were developed to show and, and, and educate our our kids about the current situation and help them deal with their fear as well. Um, we, we have about, more. Yes we have more <laughs> we'll draw as I said we'll drop those links into the comments our colleagues uh, <coughs> working behind the scene will do that for you. Maria, you've talked uh, yourself about being a parent sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's you as a human, but then there's also <laughs> you as the scientist uh, with all the uncertainty that you're living with as a scientist as mm -hmm. well. Um, which one do you want to talk about uh, with us a little bit well, today? I mean, I, I, I can talk about either, but I, you don't get, I don't always get to separate the being a parent from being a scientist. In fact, some of the hardest scientific questions I've received come from my son. Um, you know, which are honest and direct and very difficult to answer. And, and as you said, you know, it's a difficult situation for everybody. I think the first thing I just want to say is that this is difficult for everybody. Um, everybody is going through this and it's, it's new, it's challenging. We don't have a, a complete playbook of how to go through this. And I think for me, in my daily life and talking with my family and my friends, it's to acknowledge that it's okay to be not okay right now, you know, and say, and be able to talk about it. And as you said, you know, find someone that you can talk to that you trust and that you, you, know, you respect and that you get good information from and that you could be vulnerable with. I mean, I think all of us want to project a very strong and together uh, persona, and we are, um, but it is important that we have opportunities where we can express concern and we can express vulnerability and talk through that. And especially with kids, like I have two kids. Um, the younger one is, is a baby, and so he doesn't, he, he, He's, he's, a happy little, he's a happy little guy with his cars. But my, my older one, this is challenging because his daily life as ours are, are completely disrupted. So the routine that he had and the routine that all of us have, no matter what age you are, is different. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I find most helpful for everybody is to set a routine. So even if you don't know day, day, every day what it'll look like and if this week will look like the next, set that routine. Get up, you know, do your normal getting ready for work and um, you know, and, or getting ready for school or get ready for the day and then have some kind of a routine um, that makes you physically active, whether even if it's a, you know, something exercise or relaxing at home, do things that you need to do, but do things that make you happy. You know, even though it is concerning and the news is quite challenging, I would recommend not watching as much news as, you know, mm -hmm. keep it to reliable sources, but there's so, there's such a bombardment of information, but do things that every day Every day, do something that makes you happy, yeah. whether it's reading a book or listening to music or, you know, calling your friends or talking to your friends. Because we want physical distance, but we still want people to be socially connected. Mm -hmm. So there's still ways to continue to do that, and I I, I cannot stress that enough of being socially connected, even when you have to be physically distant. It, it's just, you know, keeping that connection is really really important. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've noticed is that um, you can tell that other people are going through the challenges, even from the memes you're seeing online. You'll see people talking about um, crying, uh, bouts of crying, uh, wanting to lie down on the floor and just take a, a time out. 
And I found that myself very reassuring to know that other people are, are well, it's not great, but other people are, are feeling the burden as well. And it, it does show you that these behaviors that you're seeing are, are shared um, globally in a way. So this question is in a way related to that. Is there anything positive that could come out related to mental health services because of the pandemic? Is there a way we've talked about building back greener, building back better in health systems? Are you looking at that as well in your area of work? This is a great question for me because this is our main uh, scope or, 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 or in this current situation is how do we build back better uh, in mental health? The, the, let, me, the, let me be a bit more um, less personal and more technical on, on, some, um, on some issues. I mean, the, the, the mental health situation in most of the countries is really bad in terms of the response that countries provide. I mean, the, the services are very limited. The only 2% of the health budget goes to mental health. And that means that in normal situations, there is nearly 1 billion people with a mental disorder. One billion is a lot. Mm -hmm. And s around 75% of them in, in low middle income countries do not have access to care, to treatment. And in high income countries is around 50%. So in normal conditions, there is no enough capacity of countries out there to provide answer. When we are talking about everybody being in a way affected and, and feeling uh, that things are, are, are a bit stressful or, 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 or the, the, the possibility that we see some data with some increase of, of mental health issues, then the services are not out there. The capacity of countries may not be out there to, to provide the, need, the, the, the response that we need. And so we need to use this as an opportunity to call for um, more invest, investment in mental health from each level, from each government, from the community, from the um, municipality, from the region, from the national authorities. More investment in mental health will help all of these uh, situations to avoid becoming a problem, a serious problem, because many of these issues that we are feeling will go away as we uh, as the situation evolves, uh, as we get out of, of the crisis. But for many, that may uh, still be a problem, and we need to work now in order to avoid further problems. So we don't have an estimate at this point where, as, as you say uh, so frequently, Maria, we're, this is all new. We're at the beginning, in a way, we're eight months into this pandemic, so we don't, I think, yet have statistics on the lasting impact. But from other emergencies, we do know that it can increase um, issues for people for at least a certain period of time, even after the emergency has passed. Is that right? Yes, it is right. We know from other emergencies that one in five people uh, suffer from a mental health condition during the, 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 the emergency. Um, wh what we know is what I was uh, saying earlier, that uh, a number of people will go uh, over this, the current situation will overcome with the help that we were discussing earlier, talking to friends, finding routines, finding ways of coping, uh, uh, following the suggestions that we provide in, in, this, uh, in this material we issue. So they will overcome. Others, no. Others will continue to struggle also because we will learn more and hopefully we will, we will overcome the specifics of, of COVID, but uh, we know that the economic turmoil will continue a bit longer. Can and I, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. yes. I just wanna, I wanna touch upon that because th we get this question, I get this question a lot about how long, you know, how much longer, how much longer. And we, we don't know, we don't have a complete picture of this yet. And a lot of that depends on how we, on what we do on how governments respond and how quickly we are able to bring COVID under control. But it can't be at the expense of other things. And I think what you're pointing out is, you know, we have to ensure that we have these services up and running now. You know, it's not something that can wait. It is something that is challenging all of us and it has to be done now. But I think I just want to add a touch of hope here in the sense of this duration of how long this will be because we will get through this. We will get through this and we will get through this together. And so one of the things that is really interesting about this pandemic is that we are all dealing with this. We're at different phases of it and, and depending on the country where you live, there are different capacities of countries to respond. Um, there are different levels of success and we will see success and we will see some setbacks. But you know, the entire collective global community is, is focused on this and fighting towards this and we will get through it. Um, 
it is going to be challenging and no one is, is saying that that won't happen, but we will and we will get through it together. And I think that that common goal and that commonality in it, it help, is helpful in a way. Yeah. It doesn't negate that people really need um, professional help. And I think one of the things we've seen with other uh, essential medicines that have been disrupted is that there's other ways you can have the therapies and speaking from my own experiences with families there's ways that you can do therapies through telemedicine and through through different zoom or different whatever whatever facility it may be to have that professional level help and i don't i don't know well, you yeah. this is a great uh, opportunity for me to comment if it's okay but um according to the questions i mean because um, one of the most powerful uh, tools and um, um, instruments we have in the mental health sector is talking. Mm -hmm. And that can be done without any um, impediment right now uh, if you one has access to a phone, even the old traditional phone mm -hmm. could work. Mm -hmm. Or if we put in place somebody that we a system a program in the community training somebody in the supermarket that will be able to identify when something may be going wrong or to uh, have somebody to refer to i'm not banalizing the problems can be serious mm -hmm. and we need specialized uh, professionals in some cases to take care of but many others do not need that level of, of specialization and can be taken care of if we are prepared for that, yeah. and, uh, and 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 the tele for example, we are we are witnessing or, or being uh, told about uh, colleagues putting in place uh, systems that that are, are like that telemedicine, uh, things that uh, we hope in the future will continue because mm -hmm. they are needed still uh, even when everything will be back to normal. Back to so so called normal. Um, you're touching a bit on uh, this one document we have called Basic Psychosocial Skills, which is a guide for COVID-19 responders. That's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. People who are frontline workers because they work in a supermarket or because they are uh, a nurse or a doctor or other healthcare worker. Um, so we actually have some guidance uh, that we'll, we'll drop in, hopefully in the comments as well. So you've touched on um, the chance to reshape and build back uh, better. That was a question from Steve Appleton on um, Periscope. And we also had a question from Karen Artiaga, which was about how we will deal with the crisis afterwards. And you touched on that, the importance of investing as well. Um, we have a question on from Facebook on what employers can do to help their employees deal with the stress and the anxiety. So there's, we've talked about what we can do for each other, what we can do within our communities, but what can, in a more structured way, what can employers do to help their staff? This is a very important uh, question, and um, the, the, there are a number of actions that uh, could be done uh, right away by, by any employee, employer, sorry, that are related to uh, understanding and accepting that what is happening is happening to everybody and that we all may need um, uh, some adjustment to how things were before. So it is important for, for employers that uh, have contact with uh, the, the employees and, and follow up what's going on with, uh, with them. It is important that if there is, uh, for example, teleworking, that there is a, a, a regular contact and, and, and not only to make sure that things are being done, it's not a control issue, but it's in order to provide support if it is needed, guidance on, on how to get back to the routine that we were discussing uh, earlier, it is important that in some contexts that are particularly stressful and demanding uh, in terms of first responders, etc., that uh, there is consideration about uh, how the shifts are organized, how we uh, make sure that there is some time in between uh, to, to exchange and somebody to talk to, whether it is a peer or it doesn't need to be necessarily a supervisor, but uh, generate those uh, possibilities to, to talk uh, about what's going on. I'm thinking particularly in this moment about uh, healthcare uh, providers, right? But for everybody. Uh, it is important that we provide basic tools for those managers to learn what to do, because doesn't, 
it is uh, not everybody knows how to deal with the new situation, as we said. So the, in, in the um, guidance that you mentioned, the, the basic psychological um, interventions, there are some, some specific tools about how to uh, improve a bit uh, communication skills and how to listen better to the employees and, and the current situations or challenges each one may face and be a bit more tolerant, be a bit more flexible, be um, kind and uh, not uh, discriminating anybody. I think that's a key issue right now. And what about the idea of modeling some of that behavior as well in the sense that showing that you yourself, even though you're the manager, um, may be having difficulties as well. I think you also might think, no, I need to be very strong so that we, the, you know, the whole company knows that I've got this. Um, and then on the other hand, you don't want to be collapsing either. You don't want to show too much vulnerability because that can be discouraging. So how do you even navigate between those? Yeah, we are always demanding a lot to managers, right? But, uh, but you're right. I mean, it's the, the, the balance between being a good manager doesn't mean that I need to be always with a smile in my face and, and uh, uh, pretending that everything is perfect when it is not. Because as a manager, I'm also affected by by the situation that is that is happening, whether it is uh, uh, work related, and I don't know if I need to come every day to the office, even if the floor is empty, or I can stay at home, as it happened in the beginning when when we came back, or um, how to follow up with my team, or how to cope with my own challenges and and difficulties. We've been saying the importance of working uh, at home and how to make a, a routine and how to make sure that your day begins and ends with your working time. Okay, my challenge has been how to make sure that I was taking care of this. I, 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 my, my husband sometimes reminds me, you say you, people need to take care of that and you don't. So um, that is also part of accepting that uh, we, are, we are all together on this in good and in bad. So we need to, to learn from each other and, and, and be supportive. Maria. Yeah, I just wanted to touch upon um, the frontline workers and the support frontline workers need and, and the challenges that they've been. I think, you know, we've said everyone is going through this, but I think the stress on frontline workers, health workers um, all over the world, but particularly in countries that have had really intense outbreaks, some that have worked in wards where they're dealing with incredibly sick patients with many people dying, um, that takes a tremendous toll. Um, and we are seeing through the through the the feedback that we've received from countries, um, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of cases are being reported among frontline workers, health workers, um, for various reasons. But I think one of the things we're seeing is the psychosocial impact um, and the stress impact on health workers cannot be underestimated. And we need to have systems in place to provide them the psychosocial support that they need. Need to make sure that they have adequate rest periods. Um, you know, to go in and out of work, making sure that they have the appropriate PPE and so that they are protected, the appropriate training, um, not only just, you know, the, the psychosocial support, but the equipment and the training that they need, because these are incredibly stressful times. And um, that can't be underestimated. So we're seeing more and more reports about the impact that it's had on health workers, some of whom have had to leave their jobs. Um, so I just wanted to, to specifically mention the frontline workers. And if I may add, because it is uh, definitely an area of concern for, the, for everybody, for all of us, is that um, at this point in time, we, after uh, months of, 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 of being on this situation, we need to make sure that everybody gets that uh, advice that is needed for managers, for them. The issue that I was mentioning before about peers, about discussing. We don't want personnel uh, dealing with uh, this uh, so critical situation being too stressed. They need to be. They need to be okay to take care of of themselves in order to be better positioned to take care of of, of the patients they have mm -hmm. in front of them. And in order to do that, everybody can contribute uh, from from the whole system. I mean, in 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 the hospitals or in the in the health uh, system in, in general. And also the community has to be uh, called uh, here because we have been uh, 
seen or hear about uh, discrimination about uh, people and that adds to the stress they already have and the workload they already have. They need also to be concerned that uh, themselves or their families are being discriminated, stigmatized when going back home. And, and that is something that we all need to think about and try to see what we can do to, to, to change that situation. This is a, a question that relates to the idea of stigma as well. It's a question on Twitter from Zulfa. Many people with COVID-19 are stuff, suffering stress, the people with the disease or who have recovered from the disease because of stigma. What policies should be strengthened to support them? How do you support people who have had COVID? So we were talking about the healthcare workers and how to support them, but then there's also the stigma that can come afterwards for people. And it's not just with this disease, we've seen it with, in other contexts as well. I think that uh, what, what is happening now is one good way of uh, fighting the, the stigma and I'm, 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 I'm referring to communication to make sure that everybody knows what, is, what it is and what it is not, the, 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 the situation that the person may, may, may be going through. I, I said it before, also be, be kind and, 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 and be supporting and don't discriminate. I think it is, it is very important. The person that has gone through COVID has already gone through the sufferance of the disease itself, physical sufferance, the mental sufferance, the fear of not knowing what was coming, the fear of, of not being uh, able to predict what was uh, the future, fear of dying, the uh, loneliness maybe, the being apart from family members, being isolated, a number of issues. And now that is over with that, we, we, we need to do uh, whatever is possible in order to build back the, the in this case, the, 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 secu the security, the, the, the um, being, the, I'm sorry, I'm trying to talk about yeah, what the yeah, person needs to go through and what the others, yeah. but what the, for the person themselves uh, is, is important to go through uh, slowly uh, the life as it was before or what, what is in front of us right now and try to build, gain back the, the, the confidence of, of uh, finding your role and your situation. And that, is go with, will, that will itself be a way of fighting that stigma. When, when we can show that uh, there is nothing to be uh, afraid of because of having had a, a, a condition like uh, COVID-19. So this one I think is good, yeah. good to go to you, Maria, because I think people are, right now are starting to hear, we thought it might be possible, people, people are starting to hear examples of reinfection. Hmm. That, and so that would be scary for someone who has had COVID to think, am I going to have to go through this again? And it could be scary for people around them thinking, oh, we thought this person was cured and now they might be sick again. So just to reiterate the point that we all have to continue to take precautions, whether you're a recovered patient or someone, all of us at all times have to live this new normal. But what could you say on reinfection and those question marks around that? Yes, so I will answer the question on reinfection. I just want to mention briefly on the question of the, re the recovered, the patients who've gone through COVID, because last week we had a really important meeting with some patient groups. Um, I reached out to some groups last month um, of patients who have recovered from COVID but are still dealing with long-term effects. And so it's still early days in terms of our understanding of this virus and the disease that it causes. So I reached out to this group called Long COVID SOS um, and, and they helped me and us to reach out to other patient groups. These groups are just starting to form. And what we heard from them, we listened. I mean, the point was to say, tell us, tell us, you know, what you're dealing with and what the challenges are. And what they were asking for was, first of all, recognition, you know, that this, this is a thing. This is something that many people are going through. Um, the second is rehabilitation, and not just for the physical and the, the um, biological impacts of this, but also um, from mental health and from stigma. And the third is research. You know, how do we look at what needs to be done in this patient population? So we heard them loud and clear, and we have, you know, have a way forward. We have a rehab group and we have a mental health group, but it's, it's something that we need to continue to look at. Um, so we are looking at this and, and, and making sure that those that need help will get the help that they need. And we will work with our member states because it's, it's how we work with countries and how we work with governments to ensure that those services exist. But to specifically ask your, answer your reinfection question, so this is also a question we get, we get a lot. So our, what we understand is when someone is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, this, this virus that causes COVID-19, is that an individual develops what we call an immune response. Their body develops a, a response that protects them from reinfection. And we are seeing this through a number of studies that are being conducted all over the world. 
whether you've had asymptomatic infection, meaning you haven't had any symptoms at all, but you may have had a positive PCR test, or you've had very severe disease, you will develop an immune response. What is not completely clear right now is how strong that immune response is and for how long it will last. So we have an example um, that was reported on on Monday from Hong Kong of an individual um, who we believe is, is the first example of reinfection, that is documented reinfection. So we need to put this into context because this is the first example of this and it's been confirmed through sequencing, so we know it's a different, uh, it's, a, it's a second infection out of 23 and a half million cases that have occurred worldwide. Well, we think that other infections may have occurred. This is the first one where we've seen all the science and we're able to really yes. follow this particular Yes, so it doesn't person. mean that it's happening you know, a lot. We know that it's possible, but it is something that we knew could be possible. Yeah. Based on our experience with other human coronaviruses, there are four human coronaviruses, the common cold that circulate, and people you know, get the common cold every mm -hmm. few years or so. Um, and we know from the first SARS-CoV virus back in 2013, people have developed an, an immune response, and that lasts for years. Um, for the MERS coronavirus, which is another coronavirus, um, they have an antibody response for 10 months up to a year, but then it seems to go away. For this virus, we're learning. So I want to reiterate, this is one example out of 23 and a half million cases so far, um, but we expect that people who are infected do develop an antibody response. They do develop an immune response that lasts for some time. So we're learning, um, and so, you know, please make sure that no matter what, you practice your physical distancing, you practice your respiratory etiquettes, um, you follow the local guidance that, that is being recommended, you wear a mask where you can't do physical distancing, you keep informed, all of those measures still apply. Even if you did get infected once, mm -hmm. those measures still apply because this is just good practice. And I think this is our new normal, mm -hmm. you know, as we, as we move forward, we're gonna have to have these measures in place for some time. Mm. So we said it's one in 23 million, but we don't think it's only happened once in 23 no. million, just to be clear no, on that. Yeah. No, we don't. We just have this one documentation in, in, in 23 million. And we think a few more may start to come sure. as researchers start to follow up. As we said earlier on as well, because it's a new outbreak, there hasn't been a, an opportunity, opportunity is the wrong word because it's a positive word, but people haven't been sick, gotten well, and then been exposed again that much. And right. so that's why we're starting perhaps to see some of these cases. Right but we don't think and it's happening. And it doesn't change what we're doing for the vaccine. So that's the other mm -hmm. questions. People mm -hmm. think, oh, this means a vaccine won't work. Mm -hmm. That's not what this means. I mean, we're still developing vaccines and there's incredible progress being made on this. Um, but again, the studies on the vaccine in terms of the response, the protection that a vaccine will, will provide will come from these clinical studies that are ongoing. Um, so we just, I just wanna put it into context that yes, it's possible that we could start to see reinfection, um, but you know, we have the tools in place that can prevent people from getting infected. And I think if anything, I want people to really understand that they have power in themselves, you know, to be able to prevent infection from them, you know, for them getting infected. And they also have the power and responsibility to prevent that passing to somebody else. Mm. And I think we have tools in place now that I, we just need to hammer in because this is a positive. This is a virus that can be controlled and it takes a lot of work and it takes all of us to be part of it, but everybody has a role to play, no matter what age you are. A uh, few questions about younger people, speaking of ages. So a uh, question from Facebook on teenagers and children starting and turning towards drugs, smoking cannabis, um, in part because of the, the pandemic, and you said at the beginning that we should, we should try to avoid as much as possible using drugs and alcohol as, as crutches. Um, so what about specifically around young people who may be maybe for some it's even their first time to try some of these? Well, I think that uh, it's not very different than what we, one would do in, in, in other conditions in, in the so-called normal uh, prior to, to this, which means uh, I think in this context it is important that we uh, try to talk to those uh, young people and uh, whether it is in the context of the family or, or however we relate to them, uh, to understand what is what is going on, let's let's talk about what's happening. Because if if uh, somebody was planning, I, I have plenty, and I'm sure we all have plenty of examples of uh, kids that were oh I, I was finishing my school and I was planning to do this, and then I was going to work and I was planning to 
travel and I was planning to do. So all that has an impact when it has to be interrupted and there's uncertainty we discussed earlier will have a, 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 a stronger impact if you are in the middle of an age that is per se difficult, which is when you are growing and you don't know what you will be in the future. In this current situation, well, that future is more in, in uncertain than always than ever. So it is very important that we approach those young people and ask uh, what's going on and uh, how are you feeling and uh, how can we help uh, whoever we are. There are also a number of, of tools out, out there. There have been a number of um, webinars and meetings uh, organized by youth, for youth, in order to explore uh, this, this specific situation. So always the um, communication among peers is, is, is very important. And uh, how do we then, once we understand what is the problem, we try to uh, guide for alternative uh, initiatives, activities that could take place that are not harmful as uh, 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 drugs in general consumption. So we spoke earlier and, and here as well about the how you can reach out to people virtually and use all our devices. What about older people who, I mean, much older people who may not be as used to being on these devices, may not have those devices around their home as easily and on the flip side, uh, who are being even more physically isolated because people are trying to be careful mm. not to visit them. So they have a double burden of being from in the most vulnerable, amongst the most vulnerable, and perhaps being even more isolated than, than usual. What can we offer? What can people do to help older people? And what can older people do for themselves? I think that first thing that uh, comes to my mind is my mom with 83 years old, who is uh, very agile with uh, technology so not all older people will be um, unable to so maybe we want to explore if somebody has the capacity to do a step forward in trying to get uh, means or tools that could facilitate the communication well, don't assume they can't don't make that assumption that, that they can't the yeah, yeah they so may can they may they, mm -hmm. they they many many do actually right and that is one one way but uh, also um, uh, there are those who do not have access for economic reasons or, or social reasons or whatever. So that we need to, again, as I was saying earlier on another context, is how do we reach out to the community out there? And maybe there is the neighbor next door who can talk with this person. So the responsibility of a relative may be how to identify some kind of support that could be in the context where this person lives. Then uh, what is needed for this person in terms of, for, for, the, for the older uh, person we are talking about now in terms of uh, buying uh, the things he or she needs, uh, accessing, uh, making sure that uh, um, they know how to reach out to somebody if they need help, make sure that they have uh, medication as needed because in that case most probably they will have some kind of medication and how to make sure that they have a follow-up by their uh, carers. Um, some may have some, some challenges, some, some impairments um, due to the, the, the age itself or some conditions. So we need to make sure that we explain them properly what is happening as many times as needed. We have the situation of many living in uh, homes where uh, they have had uh, tough uh, times in terms of uh, several people maybe affected around them by, by uh, COVID, but also uh, where they may have not been in touch with their uh, relatives that uh, before were going regularly to visit them, but now they can't. So how do we make sure they know why? And I'm sure we have all seen uh, videos or pictures of people across the window saying hello. So there are ways of making sure that they know and understand that they are loved, that they are being taken care of, and that this is a, a way of protecting uh, them and uh, the others uh, from, from, from this situation. We have also another tool that we developed. We are working in the area of dementia for many years, and there, is, uh, there, there was a, a, a manual of eye support that is to support uh, caregivers of people with dementia. And we, did, we developed a light version that is very easy to, to, to look at and to, uh, uh, to, to pay attention to the different needs that these persons may have and how to, to be 
uh, useful and meaningful in, in the answer we provide. Can I, add, can I add something just very briefly to say, like we've seen so many examples of exactly what you're saying and like people checking in on their neighbors, you know, checking in not only of their family members. And one of the first things I said in one of my pressers was, please help your parents and your grandparents get on digital whatever. And I speak with this with my own family who, you know, you need patience to go through with your parents to go through. And I love you, mom and dad, um, you know, to make sure that they have access to it so that when you connect, that you're actually connected and technology has changed and we're seeing the use of technology in, in so many different settings. But even in situations, you know, where you can't, we see them check on their neighbors and that incredible level of kindness is so inspiring to me and to so many of just, are you okay? You know, and you can do that while being physically distant, but still seeing someone across the fence or through the window and saying, what do you need? Yeah. You know, um, I was in China in the beginning and, and one of the things we saw and it initially was, and in that situation, you can do a lot of deliveries. There are all these called no touch deliveries, mm -hmm. you know, where things were being sent and there, and there was a system in place. And, you know, you can see that in high tech company countries and low tech and, and rural and urban. And it's just, it's just checking in on each other. And there's very, very simple ways that you can do that. If I may go with a personal uh, anecdote, I, I, I lost my father at the beginning of COVID-19 and uh, my mother was alone at home and a neighbor next door who she never talked to before knocked her door when she found out, knocked her door and asked her if you need anything, let me know, I'm here. And uh, for me that was amazing. Mm -hmm. That was the only person that could be there if anything was needed. Because you couldn't. Because you were I there couldn't. Yourself. Because I couldn't travel. Because I still couldn't go. Yeah. And uh, and because my my brother lives away. Uh, whatever. I mean, that is the person that is the closest, physically speaking, that yeah. could provide help if needed. Apart from the technology that I always use a lot. <laughs> Sorry about the loss of sure. your father. Thank Deborah. you. Thank you. Um, a question earlier on was. And you mentioned uh, the importance of explaining to older people the situation um, and repeating it if needed. And somebody asked earlier on as well, how do you explain the situation to people who have mental disabilities and may have trouble understanding why everything has, has changed so much? We, we, we need to, I mean, de depending on the disability and the condition, we need to find uh, easy ways to explain that, uh, that, 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 that what is happening uh, and, and, and why this is a, a disease and what are the consequences and how do we need to, what do we need to do to take care of ourselves, why we need to take care, as Maria was explaining before, why people are wearing a mask, because it's a way of protection when you are in, in conditions or situations uh, specific, etc. So explaining carefully and with patience uh, to, uh, according to the uh, situation. I, I, I think that in some cases we may need to explain again and again and uh, repeat again and again, but, uh, but uh, that, there is nothing to hide the, and the, the situation has been going uh, long enough and will continue as we heard before for uh, uh, some time. We can't hide this situation from people, a situation that is so not so normal or, or for any of us, for none of us. So, how do we uh, hide this from, from people? We can't. We need to, to provide that explanation. And, and I'm sure that in the same way that we have specific uh, recommendations for people with mental health conditions, there are colleagues that have developed identical ones for people with some more specific disabilities that I advise uh, to look at. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, we're going to wrap up. We're, we're uh, almost getting to an hour at this point. Oh. I wanted to wrap though, you spoke, and, and I want you to come back again, Maria. You spoke about um, what you saw that, that made you feel good, these, these examples that are, that are positive. So I'll come to you, Devorah, and then back to you again, Maria. But what have you seen, either professionally, personally, you spoke about the, the neighbor who is visiting and on your mom. What's another example of something that, that makes you feel like we will get through this together? Humans are adaptive and are finding yeah. solutions. We have seen uh, and at different levels. I'm recalling now uh, we in, in a few months ago the UN Secretary General issued a report on mental health and the need for action that, that we were involved in producing and we used examples from different uh, 
towns and places that we got at the time and then one of them was how many uh, services were closed uh, down for mental health and how many personnel working in mental health was allocated to provide care to other health uh, COVID related services. And, and then after the document was published, the authorities reach back to the colleagues working in that uh, hospital to say, okay, how many more staff you need? And they did a fast uh, selection of uh, nurses and personnel of different levels, and they hire them right away, train them and put them to work. So that is a positive example. We have examples, of, uh, uh, innumerable examples of uh, the telemedicine thing, how to activate a different kind of response specific for health workers, for example. In some cases, allow me to say this, many of the, our viewers may be from the health sector, but stigma and discrimination on mental health issues are very present in the health sector. And so sometimes it may be easier if there is a dedicated line, for example, to provide service and, and to listen to problems or issues from those working in the health sector. Uh, there have been uh, uh, the, the remote access activating services in, in different levels of the community. Um, and that is, that is more from a service uh, perspective. Uh, from, from, from one example that, that I like um, that is a service that is human is the book for children that we talk about. We have, I don't know how many, I, I lost the, the, the accountability of how many languages uh, translated. Over 100 at least. 120, 100, something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we were hitting records in, and uh, the most translated books ever. So we are very proud of that. Done with a number of colleagues, of partners, but also people, uh, actors, actresses, uh, musicians, seeing the video and proposing to read it out loud, to develop a video, to contribute themselves so that others could benefit from that. So that kind of kindness, that kind of uh, uh, contribution, I think it is, it is uh, also very important to, to highlight. That's the one called My Hero Is You, yes, right? Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you, and then Maria. So two quick ones. One is on the science. So I come from the science background and I have seen an unbelievable uh, coming together and solidarity around contributing to this pandemic. So whether it's academics or public health professionals or all over the world that are really trying to do research and do studies and, and collect information and share information in real time so that we can better respond to this. And I know people see some discourse or maybe what, what appears to be differences of opinion or arguments even. It's just behind the scenes and in, in, in my day-to-day -day life and in our day-to-day -day life, that level of collaboration and camaraderie is incredible and outstanding and fast and furious and wonderful. The second thing are kids and young people. So I, I've seen just the most amazing acts of kindness and creativity and ingenuity and um, just jumping in of like, how can I help? What can I do? So if I can't go to school or I can't, and I always bring up my son who drew his, these rainbows that he brought to school that really just, I mean, it was just a nice thing to do. I've seen children check in on neighbors. I've seen uh, young people, young adults, adults um, do grocery shopping for frontline workers and just leave it outside of their door. I've seen them offer to help watch other watch their children while they have to go to work. Those acts of kindness that are happening every single day, um, putting together care packages for people who are in quarantine, which included a plant or included a coloring book for a young child. I mean, just being very, very thoughtful. These are really simple things that can be done um, and cannot overemphasize the need to be kind. Mm -hmm. So this is challenging. Um, everybody can be kind. Everybody can look out for one another and that it starts with us. And it starts with the behavior we model for our children and for our loved ones, but I, there's just so much that we can do. And this is difficult, but I have seen really incredible acts of kindness with young people and we need their voice. We need you to be part of this with, all, with us in, in this fight against this pandemic. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that makes us happy, including the people behind the scenes here, is how interested you are and how much you tune in um, to hear what we have to say because clearly we're responding to um, topics that are of interest to you. So some of the countries that have tuned in today, uh, people from Nepal, Mexico, India, Ghana, Myanmar, Spain, um, Bangladesh, Jamaica, Guyana, El Salvador, Denmark, Vietnam, Nigeria, 
Germany, Switzerland, France, Canada, Mexico, and so on. So thank you very much for being there today. So thank you, Devorah Castell. She is our Director of Mental Health and Substance Use Department, and Dr. Maria van Kirchhoff, our Technical Lead for COVID. My name is Nika Alexandra. I'm part of the Media and Communications team here at WHO. Thanks for being with us, and we will be doing these as we always do. We'll be doing more coming up next week as well. Thank you.